You've seen the Apple marketing gimmick. Privacy, that's iPhone. So I already made a video showing you how that's so phony. So now we're all touting a new mantra. Privacy, that's Linux phone. In this video, we'll discuss this and I'll present some interesting sides to this. The answer to this question may be different for each person. So before claiming absolute truth on a Linux phone or some of the other alternatives like degoogled AOSP and secure versions of AOSP phones, let's dig deeper into this and learn the answer for you. It's funny how some groups of people become fanboys of a particular choice of gadget and suddenly everyone else is wrong and people come to my videos and leave nasty comments on my BraxMe app. I have learned never to think in extreme ways. Listen to all and oftentimes we learn a thing or two. In the case of the statement privacy that's Linux phone, I lean to the true side and a group of cybersecurity researchers I talked to would probably say false. This is actually an interesting dichotomy because if you get down to the actual facts, both sides of the story are actually talking facts. However, how it fits for you personally is a matter of understanding your threats and this is an important thing. No one can tell you your threats. You will know it for yourself and that will make you decide if a certain phone choice is good for you. Let me focus on two choices. First is a Linux phone, and second is a Google phone, Android open source project phone, AOSP. And even these have subgroups. Before I continue, I just want to tell you that I'm on the library platform, LBRY, and I post my videos there in advance, and I'm in the top 50 creators there. I have a link in the description so you can follow me there as well. Let's break down the choices again for phones within these group of privacy focused phones on my list. First, the Linux phones. And here you have to make a distinction between a true Linux phone, meaning it boots immediately to Linux. The two well-known options here are the Librem 5 and the Pine phone. Then the other variant of a Linux phone is when someone flashes Ubuntu Touch on an Android phone. This can be done on a Nexus 5, OnePlus One, Fairphone, and some newer models in beta. These phones boot to Android and then Android proceeds to boot to Ubuntu Touch. So this is like a hybrid. On the degoogled AOSB side, we have several options. The most popular AOSB is Lineage OS. And if you choose to install it without gaps, Google Apps, then it is the most supported with many more phone choices. Or it could be a GSI version, meaning generic AOSP. Then there are more specialized high security versions of AOSP, like Graphene OS, and some other favorites like E in Europe and Calyx OS. So there are many choices, and these are privacy phones in one form or another. They're all good to me personally, although some may be better than others depending on the situation. In order to explain this clearly, I'm gonna break it down by threat, and then we can see which one stands out. Now don't leave the video until you've heard all the threats because you might come out surprised. By the way, most people have multiple threats, so think about what I say carefully. The first threat is a hacker. If you're afraid of a hacker, then some of these phones will have a leg up. Now, why would you be afraid of a hacker on your phone? Well, a hacker could theoretically end up controlling your phone, reading its contents, look at and download your pics. This would be a critical threat for those that like to put really sensitive pictures on their phone. For example, a movie star taking nude selfies or a Jeff Bezos, not only because he puts nude pics on his phone, but he is the richest man in the world. So for this group of people, hands down, I would use the most locked down phone possible and that would definitely be an Android. An iOS phone would even be better. And among the Android options, the top contender would be Graphene OS. Here, a Linux phone will lose. Linux phones currently don't even get shipped 
with disk encryption. They don't have a lockdown access policy that's been hardened using SE Linux or App Armor. I'll make a video someday talking about SE Linux on your Android and how that secures it. But this is a standard feature in Android and hardened even further on Graphene OS. I'll give you an even worse scenario. If I had a Librem 5 or a Pine phone and I kept data there, the hacker will just steal the micro SD card and the hack is complete. He just walks off with all your data. Easy. So from a cybersecurity point of view, and this may include phones used for work, the options may be iOS, Graphene OS, and other AOSPs in that order. Now, if you're like me, this particular threat is not that high for me. You see, I teach many of you not to put data on your phone, especially sensitive photos. I do the same for computers, so my own habits are a bit different. My phone is utilitarian only. I listen to Spotify, take some necessary photos, and upload it to my cloud storage, like a Nextcloud for some of you, and some minimal email, and then I delete the photos. Most of my main activity is on a computer. So if someone steals my phone, I say, darn, that costs money. But the data is not critical, so I don't worry. So I just want to make it clear that threats are different from person to person and your own OPSEC procedures will determine how this can affect you. Threat number two are the internet giants, Google, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, Apple, and so on. And here we're talking about them tracking you on your phone daily. I've explained this in so many videos. On a standard Android or iOS phone, those phones track your activities 24 seven. And this bugs me a lot. The reason this is no joke is because someone compiling a profile of my activities can then use it to attack me, control me, manipulate my opinions, and sell the data to others who would do even worse, or share that data with a three-letter agency. Now, as the privacy guy, this happens to be my number one threat, because what I fear the most is the collection of massive databases on each person. Someone actually questioned me about whether iOS tracks you 24 seven or not and left a comment on my video that he doesn't believe me. <laughs> Wake up, dude. You've been sold a bill of goods. I'm not going to belabor this in this video, but I want to stop the data leaks to Google and company. Which phones are best for that? Obviously, we have to stay away from iOS or Google Android, but here there are many options all of a sudden. The best choice here, believe it or not, is a Linux phone, any of them. The reason is that Linux phones have no link whatsoever to the giants. So there's no built-in trackers or device fingerprinting or Google Apple control logins and identities that can be matched to activities. So a Linux phone is a dead end for the internet giants. In many ways, it's not much different than using a Linux desktop computer. That too would have no important trackers. But here, a secondary choice are any of the de-Googled phones. Any of them. All of them will work because they don't have Google. I don't think there's a particular advantage to any model as long as it's a newer Android version. If it's available, use Android 10. Sometimes that's not an option though, so Android 9 will be the alternative. Now you open yourself up slightly when you use the Aurora Store and MicroG. These apps are Google spoofers. They basically create a fake identity on Google services. So they will be tracked by Google somewhat if you use some apps, but the tracking won't be tied to an identity. So if you use the Aurora store, then you're doing a combination of keeping data away from Google as well as giving them some data as disinformation. This is obviously a compromise and you can judge for yourself whether even this information is sufficient for your privacy. I think for most people it is. The advantage of a de-Google phone running Aurora Store and MicroG is obviously convenience. You don't have to give up on the apps you're used to on iOS and Google phones. Well, some apps will not work, but most will. 
And by the way, you will notice that in my channel, I focus on this threat much more than others. To me, this is one of the most dangerous long-term threats of our time and is immediate. I contrast that to a hacker threat, which of course is not necessarily going to happen to you. Your approach with that threat is to prevent it. On the other hand, the collection of our data is a clear and present danger. This kind of data will render any anonymity moot on the internet. You will have no secrets, and it will be attached to your real name, and someone like me can likely find it. Number three, the third threat relates to powerful governments, three-letter agencies, and people with money that have connections to these governments. Let me explain the threat clearly. Snowden already laid out the threat of mass surveillance on each of us. The mass surveillance side actually piggybacks on the threat from the internet companies. Three-letter agencies have direct hooks into carriers, internet companies, and so on to supply their databases. Three-letter agencies also subcontracts to these companies. The biggest subcontractor is likely Amazon. And Google itself was funded by three-letter agencies during startup. But this is not the kind of threat I'm going to talk about here. The main threat on a phone is in hidden hardware and firmware that is in every single phone. And these chips called SOCs, system on a chip, can be ET calling home. So let me explain this clearly. On every single phone, and there's no exception, there's an SOC called the cell baseband modem. And this is what connects to your cell carriers. This SOC is a separate computer by itself. All SOCs are like that. They're so tiny you don't think of it that way. But an SOC is self-managing. The SOC does not care about the operating system. It only cares about connecting to the cell towers and communicating on that channel. And Google and Apple have no influence on this. In most cases, the baseband SOC is built into the motherboard. So it's just a soldered chip on the phone mainboard. Companies like Qualcomm makes a billion of these phone motherboards a year and the SOC is just a chip on it. The bad thing is that we don't know what's on this baseband SOC. We have discovered little hacks that indicate the bad things happening, but can only look at some of these symptoms. In the USA, most of these phones have a Qualcomm chip. I have another video you should watch and it's called Who's Spying on Your Phone? And it focuses primarily on this baseband modem. Let me just summarize some of the known dangers in the baseband. One of this is an SS7 attack where a government or a carrier or someone connected to them like contractors can get access to this special channel on your phone. They can send your phone something called a silent text and they can intercept your text to read them. They can turn on your phone so the mic will be on. They can call for you. They can text on your behalf. These are already publicly known attacks like Simjacker. Another way to use the baseband is through Stingray or Nimzy Catcher. A government will use a device from the Harris Corporation, originally called Stingray, or other sea creatures in newer models. This device can do passive surveillance of a group, like find out all the phones at a protest, or do active surveillance and actually intercept your messages. Stingray can allow someone to eavesdrop on you at the very least, and there are hints of capabilities that we are not entirely sure of. Let me explain this baseband a little more. The baseband modem, as I said, is running as a separate computer. It's independent of your main CPU on the phone. It's a tiny computer, of course, and likely it's running some version of Linux, but it's all proprietary so we cannot get access to it. This computer on a chip also has flash storage, and the flash storage is remotely updatable. Someone can change the programming on the fly. There's another storage on the phone for the baseband, and that's the SIM card. Data is written to the SIM card even by the OS of the phone. So the OS can read the baseband identifiers like the IMEI which is the baseband hardware ID, and then the IMZ, which is the ID of the SIM card from the carrier. It's been discovered by researchers that there are actually instructions embedded in the SIM card 
that is triggered by the silent text. This is truly disturbing, especially for those dealing with secrets. This includes IT people with security passwords, interception of sensitive texts, and the mass surveillance of certain areas by recording the MZs of all phones in a particular area. There's one more thing about the unknown operation of the baseband. In a typical phone, the motherboard and baseband are integrated into one board and electrically, the baseband modem shares the same main memory. This means that electrically speaking, the baseband modem could read what's in memory and bypass the OS. It doesn't matter what OS you have. Though a flash drive may be encrypted, memory is not encrypted. So things like passwords and encryption keys may be in memory, in plain text. Fortunately, since your phone does so many things, this kind of threat requires some timing. You can't examine memory too well after the fact. At least, that's my expectation. Okay, so what phone would be able to handle this threat? No phone can handle this threat completely. None. However, the Librem 5 and the Pine phone have hardware switches that can disconnect the baseband modem's power. If it has no power, then none of these threats can affect you. So let's be clear. Not all Linux phones are safe from this threat. A Nexus 5 or other Android running Ubuntu Touch will not help. The only solution here is hardware. If I wanted some anonymity in a protest or rally, for example, aside from wearing a face mask for COVID, I would want to have a Librem 5 or a Pine phone and turn off the phone side when needed. If I don't have this, the only way to make a de-Google phone or Android with a button to touch safe is to remove the SIM card. So in summary, it's not that easy to decide which phone will be good for your specific situation. Depends on what you do. Threat number three with a baseband is typically a threat from governments. But someone I know is clearly being attacked by SS7 incessantly, and that person needs a Librem 5 or a Pine phone. For me, I'm mostly focused on threat number two, and the other threats are important at some moments. So I think that I lean towards the answer that privacy, that's Linux phone. On the cybersecurity side, Linux hasn't had the mobile development of Android and iOS where they spent so much time hardening the physical device. So clearly, on the physical access side of things, a Linux phone is easily compromised. But on the remote hack side, this is a bit more of a gray area. Most people who use Linux phone uses open source apps, so they're not as likely to get dangerous apps. Yes, you can install a dangerous app on a Linux phone. I can make such a dangerous app myself, but with open source habits by Linux users, it's just not likely. And you can always reset the phone and it will be good again. So in real life use, I don't think a Linux phone is likely to be hacked remotely. Now the bad news is that the Linux phones are not stable yet. Power management and stability is still a concern. But I do have a Pine phone and I likely get my Librem 5 at the end of the year. But for day to day, I have to use a degoogled phone as a daily driver. For now. Now I sell some models on my store if you're interested. You'll find a link in the description. Thank you for watching my friends. A special thank you to my Patreon supporters and this channel exists only because of your support, all of you. See you next time.